I bring you good news and bad news. The good news, I will concentrate on the good news, is that the science for global warming tells us that there's hardly any evidence for anthropogenic global warming. That's good news. The bad news is that the public doesn't pay attention to it. <laughs> the newspapers don't pay attention to it. The politicians don't pay attention to it. They love catastrophes. They only pay attention to catastrophes. You all remember the Waldsterben? What happened to it? It's gone. Do you remember ozone depletion? The blind sheep? We were all going to go be blind. No one worries about it anymore. The catastrophes of the past have disappeared, and now the new catastrophe is global warming. And in the United States, uh, the catastrophe du jour is Hurricane Sandy, which isn't even a hurricane. It, was slow, it slowed down before it hit New York. It happened to coincide with another regular storm, and it happened to hit a very sensitive part of the East Coast. I understand that from Eberhard Stotko that the current problem in, in Germany is Greece. I can assure you that the problem, the Greek problem is due to global warming. <laughs> I have it on good authority that global warming is behind the Greek problem. <laughs> and if we can just take care of global warming and stop using fossil fuels, the Greek problem will be solved. At least that seems to be the view of politicians. I just read the report by the famous Professor Schellenhuber <laughs> to the World Bank. We assure the World Bank that now that two degrees centigrade, two degrees Celsius, is uh, practically here, according to him, uh, four degrees is our next goal. Unfortunately, the World Bank will now take this report and adjust their projects in the third world accordingly, and billions of poor people are going to suffer because of this report. Instead of getting energy that they can use to abolish poverty and bring them to a higher standard of living, they will have to fend with windmills and solar cells. But, you know, here in Germany, you also have windmills. So why, would, would, why worry so much about the third world when we have these problems right here? And also, we will have them in the United States come next year. Those are the bad news. Now let me turn to the good news. The good news is that the latest report of the IPCC, which will appear next year, that's the fifth report, doesn't contain anything that will indicate that humans have anything to do with global warming. I know this because I'm a so-called expert reviewer of the report, and I have concentrated on two chapters in this very thick report. It get, they're getting thicker every year. <laughs> Unfortunately, they contain nothing of great importance. So I've concentrated on chapter 10, which is called Attribution, which tells us what is causing global warming. And I've concentrated on chapter 13, which deals with sea level rise. I may not have a chance to speak about this, but we'll see how the time goes. So let me turn to Attribution. What I will do this morning is to show you how you can win an argument against those who doubt climate skepticism. In other words, how do you win an argument against climate alarmists? You simply ask them a question. And the question is, 
what is your single most important piece of evidence for anthropogenic global warming? Then you sit back and listen. That's all you have to do. You get these common responses that say, well, CO2 is increasing. Oh, sure, we know that. It's measured. That doesn't mean that the warming is caused by CO2. Or you get uh, uh, climate models show that there's warming. Well, the only evidence is from data, not from models. Or they will tell you that glaciers are melting or that Arctic ice is disappearing. And then you ask them, well, how can you tell what's causing that? How can you tell whether it's natural or man-made? And they can't. Finally, when you really pin them down, they will tell you that the evidence is in the IPCC report. <laughs> well, you have to look at the report. So let's do that. Uh, by the way, if you're ever with Mr. Schellenhuber, uh, try going with him from Moscow to Vladivostok on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Then you have five days in which to talk to him, and he can't get away. You're sharing a, a compartment with him. And he has to answer. I read a, a very good letter that uh, Siegfried Dietrich wrote to him. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't respond to these things. You can, you can give him facts. He's impervious to facts. These people are impervious to facts. So even though I will give you some facts this morning, I can't guarantee that what I will tell you will be useful when you deal with the press or when you deal with politicians. Then it becomes up to you. It's up to you. Anyway, let's see what the report tells us. First of all, the report has, as you know, a summary for policymakers. The summary for policymakers is not produced by 2,000 scientists. It's produced by maybe half a dozen. And these half a dozen are government scientists who have the view of their governments in mind. And what they do is they mine the data. In other words, they use them selectively. They look through the report and they pick out what they like and they ignore the rest. And if you do that, you can skew your result. And they, of course, they come up with the idea that they're almost 100%, almost 100% sure it's greater than 90%. Actually, the new report is greater than 95% sure that, uh, that, that global warming is caused by human activities, in particular by the growth in greenhouse gases. Have you ever wondered how they get this 90 or 95 percent? I have. I have no idea. I think they just sit around and say, oh, what shall we do this time? We want to make it more certain. I can assure you that the next report will be 99 percent, sure. And then the one after that will be 99.9 percent. Because they're never really 100 percent sure, but they're coming very, very close. Oh, well. It's all part of propaganda. So, it's all based on a comparison of models and observations. Unfortunately, the models are uncertain and the observations are uncertain. So you have a comparison of two uncertain quantities. And to make them agree, you have to do some careful cheating. I call it that. It is, in fact, a fraudulent kind of exercise, as I will show you. After you read the summary, you have to go through nine chapters, which are about a thousand pages, before you find finally chapter 10. And chapter 10 is the one that tells you, that gives you the so called evidence. I will show you the evidence. It's essentially one graph. One graph, that's all the evidence they have, and the graph is faulty. <laughs> all right, chapter 10 on attribution. Here is the graph. This is the graph that shows global temperature 
not just global temperature, global temperature of the surface, of the Earth's surface, over the last century, basically from about 1880 to 2010. You will see that there are two episodes of warming reported. There's one from about 1910 to 1940, and I think that warming is genuine. The climate really warmed, although uh, very few of us were around at the time. Uh, I, I'm old enough to have partially overlapped, but I don't remember what the temperatures were. I remember there were, there were a lot of snow. <laughs> we all walked through school through a lot of snow. And then there's cooling. And then there's another warming episode from about 1975 onward. And that warming is problematic. I'm not sure it is genuine. <coughs> so we have here a genuine warming and a warming which is not so sure, as I will tell you. That's important. Our project is called the NIPCC. Some people say it means not IPCC or never IPCC. Actually, it means non-governmental international panel on climate change. And the stress is on non-governmental. We are all independent scientists who have worked on these reports. And we now have four of them, two summary reports and two major reports. And next year, we will come up with two more another summary report, and a major report, all published by the Heartland Institute, <coughs> which we're very grateful. Very difficult to get a publisher sometimes. But I understand the reports are selling well, and we're looking forward to the new reports next year, which will be uh, coincident with the release of the IPCC report, and I hope we'll put it to rest Um, you will see something else on this graph. Uh, hidden there, and very difficult to see, uh, are the results of the models. Now you say about 30 models. How do they do that? Well, they average them in some way. And when you average them, you find that they coincide perf almost perfectly, so they claim, with the observations. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Perfect agreement. Well, it really isn't. They're cheating. First of all, the models are uncertain by about 300%. We know that because the quoted sensitivities in the IPCC report are between 1.5 degrees and 4.5 degrees for a doubling of CO2. That's a factor of three uncertainty. That's 300%. And that's just in the report. If you go to the research literature, you find that you can get 11 degrees warming with a doubling of CO2. So you get a 1,000% change. So, which one of these models are you going to take? Obviously, you'll pick the one that agrees with the observations. It's something called curve fitting. So by careful selection of the model, you can always get, always get agreement. Even though there's agreement here, the agreement here is very poor before 1960. They don't mention that. They slide over that. For example, the, you don't get the agreement between the absolutely sure warming between 1910 and 1940. Let me show you how that looks. They ignore the lack of agreement before 1960. <coughs> Actually, I have a nice anecdote about uh, Here it is. This shows it more clearly. I think uh, Carl Friedrich Ebert will love this. This shows some of the data points before adjustment. So you see the warming here between about 1910 and 1940, cooling, 
and the claimed warming from about 1975 onward to the present. The red line is the model. Notice the disagreement between the model and the observations before 1960. Somehow you don't see this in the preceding graph. You do see it in this graph, which also happens to come from the IPCC, except they don't refer to it. It's hidden. It's in the report. You have to know where to find it. I found it. Once you find it, you can see that the models and the observations don't really agree. But never mind that. How good are the models and how good are the observations? The models, as I mentioned before, are uncertain by at least 300%, maybe 1,000%. It all depends on how you choose the clouds and what you choose about water vapor and feedback, whether it's positive or negative. And I won't get into that because it gets very technical. And there's a, a real scientific issue there which uh, people are discussing. That's not my purpose this morning. I just want to leave you with the feeling that the models are very uncertain, very uncertain. I want to concentrate here on the observations. Observations are really more concrete and I think more understandable. So these are the observations coming from weather stations on the surface of the Earth. And you think, I, I think you all know the problems with weather stations. Uh, if you don't, start reading up on some of the work done by Maker Lim, Limburg, by Anthony Watts, uh, and you will learn about problems with weather stations. There are many, many problems. But never mind the problems with the weather stations. There are other problems, too. This graph now, and that's the key graph. That is the key graph of the IPCC. This is the same set of observations as before. And these show the model results without greenhouse gases. And then the IPCC makes the extraordinary claim that this difference between the, the models without greenhouse gases and the observations must be due to anthropogenic effects of greenhouse gases. Mind you, they have ignored everything else. They've ignored the effects of solar activity. They've ignored the effects of cosmic rays. They've ignored the work of Svensmark in Denmark. They've ignored the work of Fahrenheit and Lüning, the Kaltesonne. They've ignored everything. They just make the bald claim that this difference here must be due must be due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And that is the evidence, that is all of the evidence that they bring forth to support their summary statement in the summary uh, of the report. There's so much wrong here that I don't know where to start. <laughs> but let me start anyway. I will start with the observations. I won't even question the models. Uh, that uh, takes another hour. We don't have time for that. Let's just talk about the observations. Remember, these are observations of the surface, on the surface of the Earth. I will try to show you that these surface observations, mainly from land stations, this warming here, which is the crucial warming from about 1975, to the present, this warming is not seen anywhere else. It's not seen in the ocean data, it's not seen in the atmospheric data, and it's not seen in the proxy data. So that's what I intend to do this morning. They claim they know all the natural forcings. As I mentioned, they, of course they don't. They ignore the major forcings. They ignore oscillations between the oceans and atmosphere and they ignore the sun almost completely. Secondly, they ignore the observations in the atmosphere. 
the proxy observations, and most of the ocean observations. And finally, uh, notice that they only show this result for the global main. Can't show this for the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere separately. But let me go and proceed now to the next problem with uh, curve fitting. The agreement is between is 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 achieved largely by curve fitting. Evidence is shown only for the global average, not for the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, or the tropics, because it doesn't work. And they show it only for the surface and not for the atmosphere, oceans, and for proxies. And it's this gap that I showed you earlier that is their main argument for anthropogenic global warming. In fact, it's their only argument in the whole report. In all of the 1,000 pages, this one graph, 10.1b, if you want to know what it is, 10.1b, this one graph, is the one that they use as the sole piece of evidence to claim anthropogenic global warming. Now, it's interesting. We believe in atmospheric theory, at least some of us do. And the atmospheric theory tells us that the surface warming must be less than the atmospheric warming by about a factor of two. So I ask you, what is one half of zero? <laughs> Answers, zero. This is why I have serious doubts about the claimed warming between 1975 and 2000. We don't quite know what's all wrong with, it, with the weather stations, but we have serious doubt about this warming. At least I do. And we have a report published by uh, Holger Tuss in Jena, which I think will be available, which is called NIPIC versus IPCC, published last August, and available now. We will update it again, but no change in conclusion, to show that the warming reported by IPCC, the most recent warming between 1975 and 2000, that that warming is problematic, may not even exist. Interesting question is why, oh, but that's another problem. So let me now go on to the next piece of evidence. Sea surface is not warming. Well, it is sort of, but not much. Let me take, show you what we have. These data come from the Hadley Center. They're not a bastion of skepticism. The Hadley Center is a fairly impartial group. Uh, well, not quite, uh, but they're less less partial, let's say, than the IPCC. They try to be honest. It's hard sometimes to be honest, but they try, they try to be honest. And here, for example, from the Hadley Center, come the data on NMAT, NMAT, nighttime marine air temperatures. These are temperatures measured from the deck of ships of the atmosphere just above the sea surface. These are global measurements. Here they are. You notice that there's this warming between 1910 and 1940, which I said is genuine. You see it here. There's a cooling. That's genuine. And then you see a slight warming. But notice that the 1990s are no warmer than the 1940s. That's important. That's the important part. The 1990s are now uh, not any warmer than the 1940s. It looks very different from the IPCC graph that I showed you earlier, doesn't it? This is sea surface data, just published in the geophysics research letters from Viktor Goretsky in Hamburg, John Kennedy at the Hadley Center, the two of them collaborated, 
and again shows these are measurements of SST, that is, of sea surface temperature of the water. And you see the warming between 1910 and 1940, the cooling, and then a slight recovery. And again, the 1990s are really not any warmer than the 1940s. Isn't that interesting? Very much different from what the IPCC uses as their evidence for anthropogenic global warming. Now let's look at proxy data. Proxy data come from tree rings, ice cores, corals, um, deep sea sediments, lake sediments, and so on. Stalagmites in caves, uh, all kinds of geologic data which the geologists know how to interpret. I won't go into the details, but I would like to show you a historic one because it appears in a book I did uh, almost 20 years ago. This is from tree rings. It shows the warming between 1910 and 1940. Do you see it here? It's genuine. It shows no warming after 1940. No warming at all after 1940. And just so you don't think that this is an isolated case, I will show you a collection of uh, proxy data assembled by Frederick Lundquist in Stockholm, just published with Bo Christiansen uh, of Copenhagen. And it's a good piece of work. They collected all of the proxy data they could find, about 30 of them. Here's what he sent me. These are four. You'll see that most of them show the warming between 1910 and 1940, but they don't show warming after 1975. Now, proxy data have to be handled with great care. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a subject for specialists. They don't, most, I would say most proxy data do not show the warming shown by the IPCC. So there you have it. That's really the end of my presentation in terms of telling you why you should have doubts about the IPCC conclusion about anthropogenic global warming. Now it's your job to convince Schellenhuber and Ramstorff and all these other good people at PIC and then start to work on Angela Merkel. <laughs> and uh, maybe, Alt, uh, was it Altmaier? Uh, Alt, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Any of these people have open minds? I doubt it. But, but maybe people in the press do. And I think it's important to talk to people in the press about these. I have a little time left. I see I have about five minutes. Yeah, I Maybe can, I yeah. will impose on your, uh, make and a make a few remarks about sea level rise. Okay. It's really the one item that is most important because people are very much afraid of sea level rise if you live on the coast. I'll be talking in Switzerland later next week and I don't think anybody there cares about sea level rise, but here, <laughs> maybe Bavaria, <laughs> they don't care about sea level rise, but in, uh, in Hamburg and in Mecklenburg and places like that, they sure do. So let's take a quick look, and I, I'll try not to imp <coughs> infringe too much on my good friend Myrna, who will be speaking in more detail and give you real information about sea level rise. But since I did look at chapter 13, in the IPCC report, I want to show you very quickly what's wrong with it. Well, first of all, just to finish off on anthropogenic global warming, uh, the IPCC claim is flimsy. The evidence doesn't exist. We don't see that. It's, it all depends on that gap that I showed you. We don't see the gap once you adjust the temperature data. And we conclude that current warming is mostly natural, and that the human contribution is minor. There must be some kind of human contribution. After all, you know, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, so it has increased, so there should be some kind of contribution, but we don't see it. And the scientific question is, why don't we see it? What's going on in the atmosphere? And that, I think, is going to keep us busy 
for many years, IPC is not interested in this scientific question. They have no interest in this at all. We do, and most of us skeptics do. So we argue among ourselves as to what is hiding the expected anthropogenic global warming. But something, is, something is happening in the atmosphere that, that hides the effect. It's not there. We don't see it. Quick comments on chapter 13. The big problem I see with chapter 13 is that the convening lead author, John Church, has a point of view. And it's apparent. I've been following his work, and he has a certain view about this subject, which is that sea level rise is accelerating. And therefore, he ignores all of the evidence against it. Most of the evidence published shows no acceleration. So he ignores everybody, everybody's work, not just Myrna's work, which, which is par for the course, but he ignores the work of uh, Douglas, the uh, work of uh, uh, Barry in Germany, the work of uh, uh, Houston, uh, ignores everybody, everybody's work that disagrees with, the, with his view. 